Walker. Hey dolls, it's me, Wilma Fingerdoo, with another makeup and movies. This week, the makeup is from Juvia's Place, one of my favorite companies. I've got four of their mini palettes that I will be using. I'll be grabbing a color out of each of them, at least one. And this week's movie, the classic film noir, black and white, legendary Mildred Pierce starring the one and only Joan Crawford. So, you want to see how I throw this on and learn a few things about a classic film? Then brace yourself, because we're starting now. So as I said, the makeup we're using this week are the Juvia's Place Minis. This one was sent to me by Leon Plumaker, and I loved it so much. I was so impressed with it. And, as luck would have it, there was a sale going on at Juvia's Place. So I also picked up the Pink's... And these two were also recently released, the Nubian Glow and the Nubian Royal. So we're going to use uh, all of these. I'm going to use at least one color from each palette. The movie, the Mildred Pierce. Now, this was made in 1945 at Warner Brothers. And I have to start this off by saying I am not a fan of Joan Crawford. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, there are a couple of movies that she's in that I quite like her in, like The Women, uh... That's, I think, the only other one I've seen her in. So this was based on the 1941 novel by James Cain. Uh, the original novel had no murder in it. Uh, Vita ran off with Monty at the end. Now, a lot of you may have seen or heard of the, uh, the 2011 miniseries with Kate Winslet and Guy Pearce. This stayed true to the novel. I felt it was boring. I kept waiting for something to happen. It was a huge waste of my time, in my opinion. Now, for the movie, the director was Michael Curtis. Now, he directed Casablanca in 1942 and won an Oscar for that. He also directed White Christmas in 1954. He mostly worked out of Warner Brothers. That was his studio, home studio. That's where he worked. And this movie, as I said, stars Joan Crawford. It's her only Oscar-winning film. She only won one Oscar, and it was for this. And what's interesting about this was, this was the first movie that she made with her new studio, Warner Brothers. Now, she wasn't the first choice. The director, Michael uh, Curtis, and uh, I guess the, the, the studio wanted Betty Davis. They wanted Betty Davis to play it, but Betty Davis didn't want to play it because she would be playing the mother of a teenager. And one thing that a lot of Hollywood uh, actresses didn't want to do, especially on camera, was age. She wasn't the only actress that turned it down either. There were a lot of people. And Sheridan was uh, considered or even asked. She turned it down. Barbara Stanwyck turned it down. Rosalind Russell, who I love, turned it down. Now, this was a, quite a dark film, this Mildred Pierce. Very film noir. I have to say... All of the actors in this movie, almost all of them were known for comedy before this, except for Joan Crawford. I think everyone had a comedic background in film. But so having, so approaching Rosalind Russell to do this was not outside the, the box as much as it sounds, but she said no to, and, I, and I, again, there's no reason except that it seemed at the time that a lot of actresses in Hollywood just didn't want to be a mother to a teenager. But what's funny to me is that they went through the ranks before they even considered Joan Crawford. So uh, Michael Curtis didn't want to use her. And it wasn't until she offered to do a screen test, which Michael Curtis directed, and he saw her actually on film and saw her doing it and thought, okay, they weren't interested in Anne Blythe for the role of Vida, uh, her daughter. They actually wanted Shirley Temple. And again, there's a musical comedic child actress who was trying to break into more adult roles. And I'm not sure if she turned it down or they just didn't get to asking her or what it was. But uh, Anne Blythe, who was 16 at the time that they were filming this, uh, Joan did her screen test with her and they met and worked on their screen test together. When it was all said and done, Michael Curtis was very impressed with both of them. So there was no problem 
having either of them on the film. One of the other actresses in this, one of my favorite actresses, a great character actress, Eve Arden. And if you don't know who she is, she was our Ms. Brooks. She was also the principal in Greece. So if, you, if you've seen Greece, and if you haven't seen Greece, what the heck is wrong with you? That's Eve Arden. Something that's interesting too is the film o was only nominated for six Oscars and three of them only for actors and all three went to the women. So Joan Crawford was nominated and she won. She was the only Oscar win for this movie, in fact. I think Anne Blythe should have won an Oscar for this role. Something else that's interesting is that Eve Arden and Anne Blythe's Oscar nominations for this movie were the only Oscar nominations they ever had in their careers. A nice surprise in this movie is Butterfly McQueen. She's in it. She plays Lottie, Mildred's maid. But the thing is, she's not credited in this movie, and I don't know why she's not credited. I tried to find out why, but I have to tell you, she's she's one of the, the bre breaths of fresh air in this. Her and Eve Arden are just fabulous in this. Another actor in this movie is Jack Carson. He was another character, actor, comedic, best friend type. What I love about him is he's Canadian. He was born in Carmen, Manitoba. Nobody's from Manitoba. Now, as I said, Michael Curtis did not want to work with Joan Crawford, but when they started filming, Michael Curtis accused Joan Crawford of having all of her store-bought costumes. Now, keep in mind, it's the Depression, so a lot of the wardrobe that Joan Crawford wears in the initial scenes at the beginning of the movie are all meant to be off the rack, and Joan Crawford would have her personal seamstress take them all in and add shoulder pads. And so Michael Curtis accused her of this and would call her phony Joni and uh, the rotten bitch in front of the cast and crew. She, in turn, would constantly say she wanted him replaced with a real human being. You know, Joan, Joan Crawford really only ever wanted to be good at a movie. That's all she ever wanted. She didn't care about anything else. She, she'd do literally almost anything to succeed in a film. And if that meant that the director was difficult, then she would put up with it. So by the end of this production, the two of them, I guess, had become friendlier. <laughs> So much so that uh, when production wrapped, she presented him with an oversized pair of shoulder pads. So now, of course, there's a famous story about Joan Crawford and her Oscar win. I guess she didn't expect to win and didn't want to be humiliated by being at the Oscars and not winning. So she didn't go, but she won. And when she won, she was in her bed at, at the time. She uh, jumped out of bed put on a full face of makeup, her best penwa set, I'm sure, and greeted press at her front door and thanked, gave her acceptance speech there. There was even some production stills of her being presented with the Oscar in her bed. Of course, her daughter, Christina, who wrote the book Mommy Dearest, says that she faked her illness. She just didn't want to go, which I totally believe, but at the same time, What's to believe about Christina's book? But regardless of all of that, not wanting her to be in the movie in the first place, not only was Joan Crawford the only one to win an Oscar for this movie, but the movie itself was such a huge hit for Warner Brothers that it actually, in 1945, m made just over five and a half million dollars, which was more than half of Warner Brothers profits for 1945. So it just goes to show you, you never know. <laughs> be nice to everybody and don't be afraid to take chances, I guess is the, the end of that story. So the film Mildred Pierce is very classic film noir. A lot of dramatic shadows and a lot of dramatic angles. This was one of those movies where Joan Crawford's sitting there being gorgeous and just Venetian blinds across her face. You know, that kind of lighting. It was just very impressive and very dramatic. Oh, did I talk about my shirt? I'm wearing, this is by Denise Cherno. This is a, a, a Tubnal Wilma. I think that's what we ended up calling it. This is one of my favorites that she did. It's one of her earliest ones, but I just absolutely love this shirt. This is available on Redbubble, I'm just saying. But, uh, so thanks to Denise for that drawing. It's just, oh, I just love that one. Anyway, so the movie 
is very dramatic. We see a man getting shot. We don't know who it is. It's Zachary Scott, the actor, but we don't know who it is. And then we hear somebody close the door and then we have an exterior shot of the house and somebody driving off. We don't see who. We don't know what's going on. But then we cut to an exterior somewhere else in L.A. that is by the waterfront again and there's a bridge. Anyway, that's where we first see Joan Crawford, a.k.a. Mildred Pierce. She's in a beautiful mink three-quarter length coat and a hat and gloves. Clearly rich, rich, rich. And it's interesting because the studios were trying to rein in a lot of their spending. So the fur coat that Joan Crawford wears was from the wardrobe department. It wasn't created for her or made for her. The costume designer for this film is Milo Anderson. He was a Warner Brothers costume designer and worked with Michael Curtis a lot. He's certainly an innovative designer, but I don't think he really designed specifically anything for this movie. All of her clothes at the beginning of the movie, as I say, were store-bought. They weren't, well, she altered them, but they weren't made to be glamorous or, or anything. But at the beginning of the movie, clearly she has money. She's walking along the bridge, she, despondent. Now, keep in mind, we've just seen somebody get shot. And there she is walking kind of in a daze. And she's standing at the railing of the bridge and she's looking at the water underneath and she's looking and then all of a sudden she steps up on the railing. As she does that, a cop hits it with his baton and she looks and he clearly thinks she's going to jump and clearly he's right. So he just tells her to move on. As she moves on, there's this knock on a window from inside a bar, and it's Wally, Wallace Fay. We don't know who he is yet or what's going on, but that's who it is. And he beckons her to come in, and she does, and they have a drink. And he says, oh, you never used to drink it straight like that. And she says, I've learned a few things. And he goes, oh, yeah, like what? Like, this is cheap liquor. There's better at the beach house. Why don't we go there? And... We, we clearly understand from this interaction that Wally has hit on Mildred over the course of their relationship. And so he he's like, oh, back to the beach house, eh? And so they go. And while they're about to go in, he makes a mention of her husband. Oh, where's your husband? All of a sudden he's so liberal and I'm not even sure what she says. But she gets him into the house and they're starting to have a drink and she on purpose, accidentally spills her drink on herself and, and says, oh, I got to go change. He says, oh, leave the door open so we can talk. And as he's talking, regardless of whether or not she's listening, she leaves. She leaves the house, drives away. And he realizes that she's gone. He realizes he's been talking to himself for a bit now. And so he goes through the house trying to find her and then comes across this body that we saw got get shot at the beginning of the movie and now there's wally in the room with a dead body and so he's really not happy about that so he starts frantically to get out of the house he's, he goes to door to door so finally he throws a chair through a glass door and makes his way out of the house just as a cop car is driving by they throw a light on on wally and, and they shoot at the sand too like the very very aggressive cops and he's like, all right, all right, I'm not going anywhere. And his hand's bleeding from the door and breaking the glass. And so one of the cops goes in to check on the house, while the other one, I think, calls it in and administers first aid. And he says uh, something along the line of, what, what would you say if I told you there was a dead body in there? And then like, is there? And so they haul him in. Meanwhile, Mildred shows up at home. It's a huge mansion, stunning house. As she walks in, her daughter, Vita, this is the first time we see her, there's cops in the house, and she's like, she's very upset. Mother, what's going on? They won't tell me. And she says, just go to bed. I'll handle it. And so the cops tell her that her husband's been shot. At the cop station, Ida is there. We don't know who she is yet, but Ida's there, and she's looking at 
there's a lot of side eye and people looking at each other and Wally comes out of the interrogation room and then they take her into the interrogation room and that's where we start to get the story. It's all done as a, a flashback while she's uh, talking to the cops. She tells them what happened. Uh, and, of course, she has to start at the beginning, like they always do. We cut to a modest bungalow, as I said, and she's cooking. And her husband, Bert, comes home. And he's just been let go. He and Wally, he and Wally are developers, real estate developers, and I guess something's happened and they needed somebody to not work there anymore. And I guess Wally made sure it was Bert. And so Bert is not in a good mood. And while they're kind of arguing, you realize that they have two daughters and that Mildred spoils them. And while they're kind of arguing, the phone rings. And Mildred answers it, and it's Mrs. Biederhoff. And we realize that he's having an affair with her. He's cheating on Mildred, and she is, I guess, sick and tired of hearing about it and stops pretending that it isn't happening. While this is happening, uh, Mildred is making a cake. She's also making dinner, but she's in the final stages of uh, putting a cake, the decorations on a cake, and we understand that she is selling baked goods from her home to make ends meet. While all that happens, there's a knock at the door and it's a delivery man dropping off a package. It's a dress that Mildred has bought for Vita and this sets Bert off because he says that she's fresh and doesn't respect him and she's going around with airs and he doesn't like it and he ought to knock some sense into her and Mildred's like, you, you, don't you ever touch those kids? And it all comes to a head and he leaves. He just packs his clothes and leaves. As he's leaving, Vita and Kay, her sister, are coming up to the house. Kay's a bit of a tomboy and Vita is very clearly a little princess. Mama's little princess. And as they're walking up to the house, they see their father putting his clothes in the car and driving off. And when they get into the house, Vita's very vocal about... Oh, is he, did he leave us? And, well, my sympathies are with you, mother. And that Mrs. Biederhoff is very common. And, you know, clearly this girl has delusions of grandeur. Mildred tells her, oh, there's a package for you. <gasps> my dress, did it come? All of a sudden she's sweet. She's not so judgy and opinionated. When she sees the dress, she's very disappointed. It's very cheap. She's got it on and she's like, oh, it smells cheap. And these ruffles... Who would wear such a thing? And of course, Mildred hears all this and she's not upset that Vita doesn't like it. She's upset that she's disappointed her daughter. The next thing that we see is Mildred now has to get a job. So she goes out into the world to get work. Uh, she ends up in a, a restaurant to take a load off her feet and have a cup of tea. And that's where she meets Ida, played by Eve Arden. And... Ida sits her at a table and Mildred says, oh, just a cup of tea. And then all of a sudden there's a, a, a blow up between two waitresses in the place. Apparently one accuses the other of stealing her tips and it becomes very volatile. And Ida has to step in and tell them both to pull it together and comes back to Mildred and says, sorry, what did you want? Was it a cup of tea? And she goes, no, I want a job. Ida looks at her, kind of assesses her and goes, okay. Let's her know that she doesn't think she's right, that she won't be right for the job, but they're in a bind and she needs somebody. <laughs> and this is how Mildred gets into the restaurant game. In Mildred's voiceover, she goes, I became quite good at it. I took tips and I was happy to get them. And then we have a cut to her at home. This is where we first see Butterfly McQueen as Lottie, her maid. And she and Lottie are making pies at home selling them to the restaurant as well as making a wage and taking in tips so anyway mildred pierce comes home from work and there's lottie in the kitchen wearing her uniform and she's like where did you get that oh miss vita gave it to me she wanted me to wear it in case i had to answer the door and mildred goes into the living room where vita is and says where did you find that uniform why were you snooping around 
And she says something like, well, you're making a lot of fuss over nothing here. If you bought the uniform for Lottie, then why shouldn't she wear it? And Mildred says, you know that's my uniform. I, you've been trying to figure out what my job is since I got it. And now you know I'm a waitress. And that's where Vita just stands up. is like, my mother, a waitress. So she says, well, I'm not surprised. You never speak of your people or where they come from. And then the best slap in a movie. A lot of people talk about Cher slapping Nicolas Cage. Snap out of it. This is the best slap in a movie ever. Joe Crawford hauls off and slaps her, but not once, twice. She slaps her and then backhands her. <laughs> it is brilliant. And Vita is just such a pill. It's like, yeah, hit her again. You know. <laughs> of course, the minute she slaps her, Mildred feels bad and apologizes and says I wouldn't be working at a restaurant if, if it wasn't so I could learn the business and open my own she goes you're going to open your own restaurant and now all of a sudden owning a restaurant's w way better than working at one apparently for Vita and clearly Mildred is just saying all this to save face with her daughter for some weird reason and it's, it's very obvious that Mildred had no intention of opening her own restaurant, but because she's now said it to Vita, it, it's something that she has to pursue. So she goes to see Wally, and she even says, well, I have a property in mind. And he finds who's selling the place. It's this man named Monty Berrigan. So with a handshake, more or less, she's got a restaurant to open, and a new career to start. She has Ida working there. As she's getting the restaurant all set up, her husband is taking the kids away for the weekend. The kids are packing. Kay is looking for her bathing suit and uh, she coughs. <laughs> it's never good in a movie when a child coughs. So they all frig off. Mildred goes to the restaurant to continue to set it up. While she's there, Monty Berrigan comes in to check on how she's doing. He convinces her to take a break and come to his beach house for a swim in the ocean. And she finally says, oh, all right. And after they, they go swimming, they're uh, sitting in front of the fire. She's combing out her hair and he kisses her. And it's all just very lovely. And so later that night, she shows up at her house. It's raining. She leaves Monty. Monty drives off. As she's walking up to the door, her ex-husband, Bert, comes out. Where have you been? What's wrong? Kay's sick. Well, we should take her to the hospital. So I took her to Mrs. Biederhoff. It was closer. So she leaves with him uh, in the car to see her daughter. And by the time she gets there, there's a doctor on hand. They've got her in an oxygen tent. Inadvertently... Kay dies. It's the one moment in the movie where Vita seems to be a human being for five seconds. Of course, Mildred holds it together for her daughter and her ex-husband because they're clearly distraught. We don't really ever talk about Kay again. She gets blown off in a sentence. We cut to the opening of her restaurant and it's packed. It is a complete success. Wallace Faye is there sitting with Vita at a booth. Again, as I say, nobody acts like a sister or a daughter has died. And while Wally and Vita are sitting there, Mildred says, oh, I need some help in the kitchen. So Wally, Wally goes in there to help her. And while that's all going on, Monty shows up and he's brought some orchids for Mildred and talks to Ida and hands them to her and said, oh, you know, could you give these to Mildred? And meanwhile, Vita's sitting there at the booth and she knows who Monty is because, you know, he's a socialite. So he's in all of the glamour pages of the newspaper and pours the charm on. And while he's in the kitchen helping with French fries or some such thing, and Ida comes in with the flowers and Mildred knows exactly who they're from and hands them to Wally and says, Wally, will you put those in the fridge for me? And she goes out to talk to Monty and Wally's right away. He's already jealous and he's like, he throws them in the garbage. He's like, he's not having any of it. So we cut to the end of the evening. They're f just finishing up. They've sold their last chicken. They, the the uh, customers are all kind of on their way out. And uh, uh, Monty and uh, Vita are dancing to the jukebox or the radio or some such thing. And 
Mildred asks Wally to take Vita home. And he's like, well, I thought we were going to go celebrate or something. And, you know, she's pleased. And so he does. And after Wally takes Vita and leaves, Mildred's still working. She's always writing in her ledger or doing some such thing. And Monty sneaks a kiss. And she's like, oh, please, Monty, not here. And her ex-husband, Bert, walks in. He's there to talk to Mildred about the divorce and that she said that she could survive without him and she has. So he's going to give her the divorce. He's not going to contest it. So Monty comes over with some drinks to celebrate the moment and says, we have an old saying in my family, one man's poison is another man's meat. And well, that's too much for Bert. He smacks the drink out of his hand and we cut to Mildred in the police station. She's clearly in the middle of her interrogation and the detective says to Mildred, uh, well, we don't need to talk to you anymore. Your husband's confessed to the murder. And she's like, well, he couldn't have done it. He's too too kind a person to kill somebody. And Mildred goes back to her interrogation. She talks about how successful her restaurant is. In fact, she ends up with a chain. She has five of them. Then they cut to uh, Vita. She's like, well, she's paying for her to uh, do this, that, and the other thing. They show her at a polo match up in the stands Monty has been playing polo, and I guess he's won or some such thing. So Vita comes running down from the stands to congratulate him. And the photographers snap their pictures. And she's clearly enjoying uh, the easy life. There's a scene of her dancing with a young man who she's clearly dating. And I guess they're at a restaurant or or a a club or some such thing. And Mildred and Monty are sitting at a table watching them dance. And he admits to her that he's having some financial trouble. And she immediately opens her purse and starts handing him some money under the table. And he's very embarrassed by this. This is Mildred, please. You know, I have my pride. And she seems to think he doesn't. But anyway, so then we cut to Mildred at work. And she's talking to Wally, Wally. And he's saying, well, there's a lot of expenses here that are unnecessary. Like you're, you're paying for all of this stuff that's clearly for Monty. And why is that happening? And he starts to say to her, you know, I, I, I did a lot to get you into business. And now you seem to be completely ignoring me. And she, she says, well, I'm in love with Monty. And he's like, he takes this quite personally. And he's upset. And she says, well, now you know. And uh, so he, he leaves in a huff. He's clearly not happy about this. Uh, as he leaves, Ida walks in and she tells Mildred about Vita borrowing money from all the waitresses and how they're too worried for their jobs to say no to her to bring it up with, with Mildred. And Mildred's just embarrassed by this. She can't believe that this is happening. And so she says to Ida, well, I'll I'll pay for, I'll pay all, I'll pay them all back. And as that's happening, Veda and Monty come into her office. Veda speaks French as she kind of talks down to Ida. And, and as she's leaving, she says to Monty, don't look now, but you're standing under a brick wall. And he says, I don't get it. And she says, well, you will when it falls on you. And then all of a sudden, Veda lights a cigarette. And Mildred's like, what's going on? Why are you smoking? And she said, well, I just started because Monty bought me this cigarette case for my birthday, and it would be terribly uh, recherche for me not to use it. And clearly another air that Vita's throwing around, and Mildred says to her, well, I bought you something for your birthday too. And she goes, oh, really? What is it? And she hands her the keys. A car? Where is it? She's, it's in the parking lot, and she's just all of a sudden now, for half a half, hot second, she likes her mother. And Monty pipes in, well, what about me? I help pick it out. And, and she's like, oh, you're terribly sweet, Monty. And she runs out the door and gets in the car and drives off. And after she's gone, Mildred kind of confronts Monty and, and says, he tries to kiss her and she pulls her head away. And she says to Monty, I want you to stay away from Vita, that his influence is why Vita's starting to drift away from her. She's constantly making fun of her in French and judging her for working for a living. And, and Monty says, well, I always knew it would come to this. And she, before he leaves, she writes him a check to say, well, you've been very good to us and I know you've had expenses taking Vita out. And as he takes the check from her, he says, I always wondered what it would feel like to take a tip. And she says, 
Well, now you know. The next scene is Wally at what we realize is his own bar. He has a little speakeasy. And Vita's there with the boy she was dancing with at the club. And he's brought champagne to the table. Clearly, they're celebrating something, although we don't really know what yet. And he makes a toast to true love. And uh, the young lad starts drinking. And Vita stares at Wally over the rim of the glass. And he stares at her. Clearly, something is up. The next scene is Mildred at work. And she's talking to her, her accountant as... Ida walks in and says, there's a a Mrs. So-and-so here to see you. And it's this boy's mother. And while they're talking, she more or less says to Mildred that she doesn't think it's a good idea for their kids to get married. And Mildred's like, get married? And she's like, well, yeah, hasn't Vita told you? And clearly this whole meeting is just this woman doesn't want some nouveau riche, déclassé girl getting her hooks onto her, her son a.k.a. the family money. And Mildred all, more or less just throws her out. She's just so taken aback and offended by what this woman's inferring. The next scene's her talking to her daughter and saying, do you want to marry this boy? And she goes, Mar- Mother, we are married. I married him on my birthday. And she's like, what? And so this just gobsmacks Mildred and and Vita kind of passes the whole thing off as something that he, the the boy talked her into. And the next scene is them at this boy's mother's lawyer's office. And they're talking about having the uh, marriage annulled. And they all seem to be moving along just fine. Wally's there kind of acting as a representative to Mildred and Vita. And he says, now we need to talk about financial compensation. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, my client would like $10,000. <laughs> and the lawyer says something like, well... Who wouldn't? She's got to provide for the child. And they're like, what? And Vita's just sitting there stony-faced. And Mildred turns to her, Vita. She says, I'm going to have a child, mother. I need to think of somebody other than myself now. And the next scene is Vita at home with her mother. She's got the check in her hand. I think she even kisses it. Mildred realizes she's not pregnant. She goes, you lied? And she's like, well, it's all a matter of opinion, mother. And my opinion is I'm having a child. (laughs) So she's... Just like, what? And she goes, yeah, like this 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 money will do. I'll have to give some to Wally to keep him quiet. But yeah, this should set me up all right. That's when Mildred is like, that's all you ever cared about was money. And they start arguing and Mildred grabs the check out of Vita's hand and rips it up in front of her. And, and Vita smacks her, knocks her to the floor. And the look on Mildred appears, it's a shock, utter shock. And she immediately just throws her out of the house. That's it. Pack your bags and get out. Now, something to know is that Joan Crawford told Anne Blythe to slap her. I want you to slap me. So it's quite a realistic slap, and it's a, it's a good one. After she kicks Vita out, it's weird because she says, I, I went away for a while. I don't say how long or why, but when she comes back, she arrives at the restaurant where Ida is, And I was like, well, how was Mexico? And they're chit-chatting. And finally, Mildred asks about her daughter. And she goes, I wonder how long it would take you to come around to that. And she says, "Uh, I don't know. I haven't haven't seen her. But your husband's been calling every day. And the phone actually does ring. And it's Bert. And he wants to take Mildred to dinner. And he does. He takes her to Wally's little speakeasy Mildred even says oh I never liked this place does Wally still own it and he says yeah and while they're continuing to talk the band is playing and a girl comes on stage and starts singing it's Vita she's become a a a lounge act and Mildred's just happy to see her because she does love her daughter regardless of what a horrible person she is but also there's there's extreme guilt that she's been reduced to this she even looks at Wally. Wally's in the place, and she even looks at him like this. How could you let her do this? And he's like, well, yeah. so she goes backstage after her number to talk to her, and Vita's very cold and dismissive to her mother, and nothing gets resolved. And her mother even says, "Well, can I see you?" And she goes, "Well, I'm usually here." 
And then we jump to another scene where we see a for sale sign and it's Monty's mansion. And in an attempt to get Vita back, Mildred is there to buy the mansion. I don't know, for, for, for two people that had a kind of rough separation, they seem to be not feeling as badly towards each other. And it ends up that, that Mildred says, uh, you could do me a kindness, you could ask me to marry you. And he's like, what? And he says, well, I can't go back to the way things were. He says, I'll marry you for a share of your business. And she's like, how much? And he, he says a third. He wants a third of the business. And she says, sold one Berrigan. And the next scene is her in the house and her husband, her ex-husband Bert shows up. Uh, of course, we've seen that there's been a, an announcement in the paper that she's married. He lets it be known that uh, he's got Vita with him. She's waiting outside. And he gives her some story as to why Vita's interested in, in moving back home that has nothing to do with money or the mansion that Mildred's bought or any of that. Mildred's just thrilled to see her daughter. So she has Bert bring her in and they have a tearful reconciliation and Bert leaves as the two of them are reconnecting. And then we cut to Vita's birthday party. There's a cake and everything. And Mildred's at work. She's apparently there's some important business meeting that she has to attend. And she even calls into the house to see how everything's going. And Ida answers the phone. It's like, well, where are you? You know, you should be here. And Mildred says, I'll get there as soon as I can. So at this meeting, uh, Mildred finds out that the creditors are worried about the loss of revenue due to her spending money on Vita and Monty. So they force her out. Uh, she can still manage the restaurant, but she uh, doesn't own it anymore. And Wally tells her, well, this wouldn't have happened if Monty hadn't forced their hand. Wally says that he had to go along with it or he would have been out as well. And Mildred Livid calls the house and finds out Monty uh, and Vita have left. And she knows where they are. And as she goes, she opens the desk drawer and finds her husband's gun sitting there. And the next thing, she drives out to the beach house. And that's where she sees Monty and Vita kissing. Well, Vita says, we're running off to get, and, and we're getting away from you. And, and Mildred's just gobsmacked. And she reaches under her coat to grab the gun. And Monty comes up to her and says, that won't solve anything. She drops the gun and runs out of there. And then he turns on Vita and says, what was all of that? talk about us getting married like I would marry someone like you and he starts to talk down to her the way she talks to her mother and she's like Monty why are you saying all these things and she picks up the gun that her mother left and shoots him shoots him dead in fact she shoots him so <laughs> much the gun runs out of bullets and he's lying there dead Mildred who's at her car by this point hears the gunshots and comes back in and starts oh mother oh mother you have to help me he was saying such awful things and and then the gun I, it just and, and now and mildred walks over to the phone very stoically and she uh asks the operator for the police and vita's like oh no mother you have to help me you have to protect me after all it's you that it, you're the reason i'm like this and that seems to trigger something with mildred and also the fact that her daughter clearly needs her and so she hangs up the phone and Vita starts crying and hugging her mother and we're back in the police station and she said she says I was going to take the blame for it myself and they said well uh, it didn't work and they take Vita off to book her and as she goes Mildred goes up to her to hug her and she just stares at her mother and goes I'll be all right mother and they take her out of there and it's now morning the cops said for them to release everybody and Bert is outside waiting for Mildred and they they hug and walk away and the music swells and it's all done and it just it's such a melodramatic classic film noir movie even the last scene where they're walking out of the police station there's a couple of washerwomen on their hands and knees scrubbing the floor and they're walking, they walk down these side stairs and then out the open 
doorway, archway, whatever, of the police station. It's very gothic. It's very square and bigger than it needs to be. And the, there's clearly like a a set painting of a sunrise. And it's uh, boom, boom, boom. Cue the Oscars. <laughs> but it's it's definitely... There's a reason this is a classic film. It's, there's a reason that this movie uh, is still today watched. I mean, as I say, Michael Curtis did such an excellent job encapsulating that German art house, art deco, gothic feel, the heavy shadows and the weird camera angles, and uh, especially the shadows that they throw across Joan Crawford's face because there's a lot of scenes where it's like where is she standing that that's a shadow do you know what I mean it's just very very interesting and and uh, I, I the more I watch the film the more I see in it and uh, that's why I think that it's it's a must see for drag queens especially if, if uh, they're a fan of the movie Mommy Dearest and have not watched a real Joan Crawford film if you're only going to watch one watch this one it's it's her best she won an Oscar for it uh, uh, it doesn't get much better than that all right, I'm going to finish my face, finish my lips, throw on some eyelashes and some horror, and I'll be right back. And there you go. How glamorous. I want to thank Denise Journeau for yet another fantastic wig. We're calling this one the Ginger Lake, Veronica Lake, but Ginger. I think this is just, oh, it's the, as I pull hairs out of my eyes, it's the nicest wig next to the last one I had on from her. She does such a good job. I'm so humbled by this. So anyway, let me just make sure this is on right. Oh, there, that's better. Oh, there, now she's on. Oh, let the wind happen. I thought that I would go film noir with a little hat on the side, but I now that I see it, I wish that I had done that uh, other wig up in victory rolls for Mildred Pierce. But 1945, classic film. It is uh, timeless. Well, it's not timeless. It's absolutely a great representation of uh, film noir, which was a real big period uh, of filmmaking between uh, the third, well, the 30s, the late 30s to 40s, very influenced by uh, the German art films. And the reason that that's the case is when the war started to break out, a lot of Germans got the hell out of Europe and uh, a lot of them, a lot of the artists, a lot of the filmmakers went to Hollywood and Hollywood was richer for it. Uh, as I say, Michael Curtis worked almost exclusively for Warner Brothers. Uh, he uh, directed as well Casablanca, which he won an Oscar for, and White Christmas with Danny Kaye, Bing Crosby, Vera Ellen, and Rosemary Clooney. And among so many others, he worked a lot with Errol Flynn. Uh, he directed Betty Davis in five movies, including her first one, which was Cabin in the Cotton. I'd love to kiss you, but I just washed my hair. And we're all better for this movie being made, for Joan Crawford making such a big deal to be in it. And as I say, Eve Arden and Anne Blythe both got their only Oscar nominations in this film. So it's a classic. It's a must-see. I also want to thank Juvia's Place for making these fabulous little minis. I'm not even sure how much they are regularly. Maybe, maybe $9? They're not expensive. But uh, we have the Nubian Glow, and you can get the Nubian Glow with the Nubian Royal. They're a... You can buy them as a bundle or individually. And then they're minis. They have the chocolates. They have the berries. I have the pinks, the sweet pinks, and the violets. This, of course, was sent to me by my Patreon friend, Leon. And uh, he really was the reason that I bought the other three. I love this one so much that I had to have a few more. And it's Juvia's Place. I love Juvia's Place. You can't go wrong with Juvia's Place. Get used to Juvia's Place. I use it a lot. Speaking of, my blushes from Fumi Desilu Vold's collab with Juvia's Place, the Queen palette. I also used Alyssa Edwards' 
from Anastasia Beverly Hills for my eyebrows, for my uh, black setting, my eyeliner, and I don't go anywhere without my NYX contour palette. So there you go. That is the face. That is the movie. And before I go, don't forget to like this video if you did. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't. And if you know somebody who likes classic movies and would like to hear a drag queen ramble on about them while she puts her face on, then share my video with those people. I'm sure they would appreciate it. And until next time, miss me. Mwah. Seriously. I have no more room for any more Juvia's Place makeup. That's the problem. It's just too perfect. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby, Let's all go to, the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy. The chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.